Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm wearing a necktie from Marietta College, um, College Marietta College Pioneers. A couple shout outs. Uh, Kim Mernix, who is uh, the Ohio Director of the Ohio Department, uh, our Director of the Ohio Department of Budget and Management, is also a Marietta College graduate, as is Dave Rose, who is right out in the room, the other room you can't see him, but he helps us every day with the production of our press conferences. Uh, he's the internal communications manager at ODOT, and he is also a proud graduate of Marietta College. This is uh, a big week as we move forward to open up our economy in Ohio. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we reopen uh, consumer, uh, retail, other services. Uh, we've set out the guidelines uh, and what those businesses have to do, and as they meet those, then they can they can open. I know many of them are looking forward to opening uh, tomorrow. I'm confident uh, that we can, in fact, do two things at once. Uh, we can protect Ohioans. We continue to do the social distancing. Uh, do all the things that we need to do, uh, and at the same time work to open up our economy, open up uh, more businesses. Now, we have a video that shows many of the safety measures uh, that we're already seeing in Ohio businesses and that uh, we'll continue to see. So I think this is a kind of a quick, good summary uh, of some of the safety measures that are now in place in Ohio. It's important for people to feel safe when they go to work, and it's important for people when they go out uh, shopping, go to the grocery store, uh, it's important for them to feel safe as well. That was a good summary. Uh, by tomorrow, 90% uh, of Ohio's economy uh, will be back open. Uh, and so that is the good news. Uh, face coverings are mandatory uh, for most workers and most businesses, uh, with some exceptions, specific exceptions, having to do with worker safety. Uh, it's also up to individual businesses business owners to decide if customers was, must mer wear the mask inside the business or not. Again, that's up to each, each individual uh, business. Let me start off uh, by talking about uh, child care. And I want to start by saying that we will not be making an announcement today. Um, we are still working on this, and I want to talk a little bit about it. Uh, but it's very, very important that we get this right. And we don't want to announce the date uh, until we have the protocols in place uh, and that we can uh, explain those uh, to all the caregivers out there uh, and, and all the families out there. Uh, I certainly know how very important this is. As we open Ohio back up, uh, that um, child care is absolutely an essential part of people being able to go back to work. Um, throughout my career, uh, I've focused a lot on children's safety. Uh, sh so it should be no surprise that uh, as we look at this, uh, we continue to really focus a lot on not only children's safety, but the safety of the families uh, that they're from and, and the safety of the workers. Um, who go into the child care every day, who take care of our kids, 
take care of our grandkids. Um, sometimes we don't think about them, but I want to say thank you to each and every one of them. Uh, we also are very concerned and very focused on making sure that the rules that we put forward uh, protect them as well. Uh, let, let me be quite candid. Um, the mistakes that I have made through my uh, long career uh, have come about when I did not have all the facts, when I didn't dig deep enough, did not ask the right people. Uh, and so this process is continuing. Um, we're going to continue to do this. Uh, reopening child care centers is simply, simply too important to do so without making certain that we have all the best information, that we have all the right protocols in place. We continue uh, to gather this information, and it will not be long until we'll be in a position to make the announcement. Uh, I do not intend to move forward on opening child care centers until Ohio has the most science-based and safety-based plan that we can put together. And that's my commitment. Child care is a necessity for working families as they go back to work. As I've said, there are risks associated with action and also risks associated with inaction um, as we move forward. There may not be a more important decision uh, that we make in regard to the safety of Ohio as we move forward and the safety of Ohioans. Uh, I'm convinced that we can lead uh, in this area. Not only am I convinced that we can lead, uh, I'm convinced, convinced that we absolutely must lead. We must lead in this area. Our goal is to develop the best possible protocol in the country to ensure the safety of our children and our child care center workers and the safety of their families. Uh, it is really a moral imperative that we do this. And that process uh, will, will continue. I want to announce uh, that Jobs Ohio, the Ohio Department of Commerce, and the Ohio Liquor Control are implementing a liquor rebate, rebate program so that bars and restaurants can defray the cost of restocking high-proof spiritus liquor. The program will provide a $500 rebate in high-proof spiritus liquors for eligible permit holders who purchase through Ohio liquor contracted agencies. Uh, this rebate will help a majority of our state's liquor permit holders. The rebate is designed to help reduce the cost of bars and restaurants as they restock their shelves for reopening in the future. Um, these are instant and applied as soon as a permit holder places an order from their assigned liquor agency. The rebates can be used beginning mid-May. Restaurants and bars interested in the liquor rebate program can visit wholesale.com ohio.com uh, for more information. During our regular COVID-19 briefings, uh, we've talked with you about the data and we've talked about the science. We've also had doctors and other experts join us on Skype. But today we wanted to give you a different perspective, a first person perspective. Travis uh, is with us today, and we thank Travis for joining us. He's an emergency room nurse at University Hospital's Portage Medical Center. He is also a COVID-19 survivor. So, Travis, thank you very, very much for joining us. And there you are. Well, good. Travis, thank, thank you for having me, Governor. Thank you for joining us. And if you could just kind of tell us a little bit, uh, Travis, about your experience. Um. My experience, it was quite the, quite the event. I initially got sick at the end of March um, with cough, temperature, um, stayed home from work, which was our protocol. Uh, within a week, my symptoms had gotten worse uh, to the point where I had a high grade fever, headache, cough, uh, and my shortness of breath was to the point where I could barely get up and around and walk. 
So um, going, getting to that point, um, I couldn't keep my temperature under control. Uh, my wife had checked my oxygen saturation at home and it was uh, very low for a patient of my age and uh, health. So I, that's when I decided to go to the ER to get checked out to see what was going on. Um, once there, of course, they did a great job. They got the chest x-ray, which had showed the signs of COVID on it. Um, the doctor told me that I was going to be admitted just to check, keep an eye on my oxygen levels. So in my mind, I was thinking it was going to be an observation kind of stay, um, making sure everything was okay before I could go home. Uh, but the next day, things had gotten worse to the point where I could barely breathe. Uh, and they took me down to the ICU and I was innovated for four days. Travis, how long, how long, how long were you in the hospital? Altogether? I was in the hospital for eight days. Uh, that must have been a, a frightening experience. Not being able to get your breath has got to be horrible. It was uh, very frightening especially since I kind of knew what was going on and what was going to happen. Uh, but the staff there was very comforting towards me. Um, they were, I couldn't ask for better staff. And how are you doing now? I, now I feel great. Um, I went back to work last week uh, and it felt good to be back in the ER with my coworkers. <laughs> I bet it, I bet it, I bet it did. I bet it did. Um, so uh, you, you originally started feeling sick how long ago then? Uh, now, it would have been a little over a month ago, about end, end of March. Last weekend in March I, is the first symptoms I started having. So this, this, this journey from first feeling it till now getting back to work, and you went back to work when? Just, uh, just last Tuesday. Last Tuesday. So that's uh, almost a month experience then. Yes. Wow. It Do was quite the journey once I got out of the hospital just to regain my strength um, and just to do basic things at home. But um, now I feel back to 100% and I have to be back at work with, be back at work with my uh, coworkers and uh, just everyone there. Every yeah, no, that's great. Oh, that's that's great. Did did you think you had COVID nineteen? Did you kind of self diagnose or? Um, I didn't want to accept the fact that that's what I thought I had. Um, but in the back of my mind, yes, I probably thought I had it. Um, but being an ER nurse, I'm I'm stubborn and should have probably went sooner to the hospital than I did. But I'm grateful for my wife who pushed me there. Dr. Acton is, is is also here. You can't see us, but Dr. Acton, do you have any, any questions? Hi, good afternoon. Hi. I, um, two things kind of strike me that I've been hearing, and since you, you also work in the ER, you're probably seeing some patients as well. Um, but, you know, people do think, like, it's a hard recovery I've been hearing from patients. Sometimes it takes a while, and especially for strength to come back. I just talked to a young gentleman in his 20s who, very great shape, <laughs> unlike those of us middle-aged folks, and was saying to me it took him a good month, month and a half before he could do his regular exercise. Is that something you're, you're feeling and did you see in other patients? Um, for me personally, I, when I got back home, um, I started kind of doing little things once I got my strength back. And then I started... Uh, walking a little bit um which really helped i think uh, but it does take a very long time to recover from this once you've had it and, and went home to get back to full strength was there anybody in your life who'd had it did you know anybody who had it in uh, no. your family okay and and I, I think that's something, too, here in Ohio. You know, we still, a lot of us have not caught it yet, but I think a lot of us are wondering, do we know someone in our lives who's had it? So I bet a lot of people 
were curious to see that you did. Yeah, no, I heard uh, family wise and friends, I have no one that I've known has had it or had it prior to me getting it. Um, but so it's, it was quite the experience to, to go through with my family and my coworkers and, who were there for me. And, and Travis, how, how did that, that had, that has to be tough, uh, on the, on your family. Yes. How'd they get, yeah. how'd they get through that? All right. Or how did it, it was very hard for my family, uh, doing to the no visitors at the hospital to keep this down. Uh, but the hospital brought an iPad into my room, uh, each day. So I could, um, we could communicate back and forth to each other. Uh, and my work family also reached out uh, to, to my wife constantly, making sure that uh, she didn't need anything at home. Um, we have a great team at the hospital. I cannot thank the UH leadership and my coworkers uh, enough for their support and care during this difficult time for us. Great. Sean, you guys? No, I, I was just was curious about that myself, about whether or not you know, you went through it, but you were able to to live in a way where nobody else who was close to you uh, got COVID. And, and just talk about if there is a little bit more insight on how you, you were able to prevent the spread in your own situation. Um, to prevent, I mean, for me, it was, I kind of, when I got sick, I separated myself in the house, um, would only uh, not really leave the room that much unless I had had to. Um, so I was separated from everyone, uh, just trying to keep that, the chances of them getting it down, which luckily no one did get it in my house. So, Wow. Wow. Well, you are, uh, you're clearly, uh, you know, these personal experiences I think are, are really important for all of us to hear. Uh, I think we're super happy to, to see that you're, you're back at it, you're recovered and and uh, and and now you're con you're continuing to be one of those frontline people who are serving others. So we thank you for that service as well. Travis, Travis, thanks so much for sharing with us. We we are very very grateful for you doing that. We we had not had anyone here who had gone through it, and and we really thought it was important to have someone who lived through it to to really talk to the people of Ohio about you know what that experience was like. Yes, thank you for having me. And thank you to your team, too, on the front lines. We're thinking about all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. Appreciate it very much. Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I uh, hope everybody had a pleasant Mother's Day weekend. Uh, thanks to all the great things that the moms out there do out of love and responsibility. Um, we appreciate you. Uh, it is, I've often talked about May as moving month. There's a lot of things that are happening, uh, Governor uh, basically recognize what a big week is, was, this is during his earlier remarks. Um, as of tomorrow, when retail opens, 89% of the Ohio economy will be open for business. Uh, as we move to Friday, we'll have personal care and outdoor restaurants. So restaurants have been doing carryout and delivery. Now they'll be doing outdoor uh, and take us close to 92% of the economy open. We, we're, we're looking at all of the other things that still remain closed. I know I was on a call this morning with the gyms and fitness center that are working with the health departments to talk about protocols there. For that future, you know,
you can walk around without the symptoms, you can give them to somebody else, and, and, and it could be somebody's mom or dad, grandfather or grandmother, who is really, really in a tough spot and very susceptible to mortality. And that's what I mean by mutual respect. It's about looking out for those, looking out for those of us who, um, who could be very vulnerable to, to this virus. And so, you know, that's why we're all in it together. That's why we talk about these things. So as we're moving forward, as we're looking to that future, um, just a, a friendly reminder uh, of, of what we owe to each other as, as we do that. And Dr. Acton is going to talk a little bit in, in a little bit about the antibody testing. There's been a few news articles about some of the things that, that we're doing there. But I want to take this moment to recognize some people that made that all possible. You see, it was one, one Sunday afternoon I was trying to find people to send us these tests. I was on the phone calling. I finally found this company, Celex, who was the first company, I believe, that the FDA uh, approved for this testing in, in our country. And um, I talked to the CEO, and, and he said he would get us the tests. There were some other states that were competing for those tests with us. But getting them back here, getting them to Ohio, seemed to be an insurmountable, because they were going to come from China, seemed to be an insurmountable task that we were going to face. Uh, but I had an offer from NetJets. They said, if you need planes for anything, if there's anything we can go get for you during this, during this, uh, um, this period of pandemic, then let us know. And NetJets is headquartered in Columbus. And uh, NetJets did an amazing thing. They got some of their planes, and they sent them to Anchorage, and they got all the permits, and they worked with the Chinese government and, and the company, uh, and it eventually went to Shanghai, took their planes to Shanghai, uh, and, and were able to get the tests, flew them back to Anchorage and then to Columbus. But it's just an example of an Ohio company that just stepped up uh, to help us with something that was really important. And you'll hear more about why that's important when Dr. Acton talks with you more about that later. But that's just another example of businesses who are in the community spirit, in the all, in it to all together spirit uh, that are helping us out. And, uh, and I want to thank them for that. And I want you to know we are looking forward. Uh, you know, we're getting through this difficult time, but we also know that there's a future out there when, when we get through this. Um, every day we're talking to more and more entrepreneurs who are discussing with us what the future is going to look like in this post-COVID world uh, from a business point of view and an entrepreneurial point of view and how we can talk about how to position Ohio for those opportunities of the future to create jobs and, and, and prosperity here. And you take something like the Manufacturing Alliance. The Manufacturing Alliance has been producing the swabs and the face shields and the things like that that we couldn't get a hold of earlier in the crisis, and they started to produce these things. Well, we're thinking long-term with them. We don't ever want to be in a position where we have to depend on other countries to source our vital PPE and, and medical needs. And how do we continue to build a market for them, both in Ohio and domestically, so that we don't find ourselves in that position again? We're also working every day on that broadband strategy. We know it's not, broadband's not only important, it is critical when you find yourselves in a position where telemedicine is so important, when children are, are seeking education from home. So building strategies about an economic health and education strategy around broadband. All of these things are part, that are things that we're working on right now uh, to, to build that winning future for us in Ohio. And, and it's that partnership between government and the private sector that has, has made America great. It, it is the source of great optimism for our futures. And I want you to know that these things are already underway in Ohio. So as we're in the midst of this pandemic and these businesses are helping us solve it, they're also working with us uh, to look at that, that, that future that we're all, we all long for. And, and we can do more than one thing at a time. We can do more than two things at a time. We're doing all of this right now. And, and um, there's a reason to be hopeful as we look to our Ohio's future. Governor? Dr. Acton. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Monday. And I think we'll start with our numbers. Um, first of all, right now in Ohio, we have seen 24,777 cases as of today. That's up 696 cases from yesterday. In the country at large, there are over 
uh, 1,329,000, so it's, it's quite a few cases. Um, the deaths in Ohio at this point are 1,357. That's up 16 um, in the last 24 hours that have been reported. Almost 80,000 deaths in this country at this point. Next slide. So a couple new things on our overall dashboard I want to point out for you, Governor. Um, we now have an age range of a case from less than one, which is an infant, to 108 years of age that has been diagnosed. And also a very interesting um, fact for us, um, and I, I believe it's not on this slide, but in other data we have on our website, that we actually have a new date of onset. We have found five cases now that the, age, that, that the date of onset of symptoms was in January. So uh, five different cases so far, five different counties, um, and we're doing a lot more investigation. Our disease detectives are going back to take a look at that and see if they were associated with travel. These cases now, we can pick them up because of the antibody testing that the lieutenant governor mentioned. So we will learn more and more about this disease, how long it was here in Ohio, how long it was spreading um, as we do more and more testing. So I, I, I found that interesting, and you can look on our website to learn more about that. Um, next slide. Uh, our trends, again, by and large, staying very plateaued in Ohio. We have these daily ticks up and down, but by and large, we're still in a plateau phase. Um, and next slide, Eric. Um, also, our testing numbers. I did want to talk for a second about testing. So, you know, one of the things about testing is that it is a snapshot in time. When you get tested on a given day, you might be negative, uh, but you might be early in the disease process and we haven't picked it up. Um, also, um, it doesn't mean if you tested negative that you won't still catch it in the next couple days to come. So it's really important for those of us who get tested and find out we're negative. Don't, I don't want anyone to get a false sense of security from that. I want you to know that you still might be early on in the onset of disease, and, and you might be carrying it still, and you might yet catch it. So it's really, really important that we, we understand testing for what it is. It is not treatment. Testing is actually the most important thing about testing is that when we find a case, it allows us to do that contact tracing, that investigation to see who you might be in contact with. And that allows us to stop that logarithmic spread. The most important thing about testing and why we're using our testing so judiciously is we want to break those chains of transmission. When you test positive or even if we don't test you, we still treat you the same way. The treatment is not changed. But it's vitally important what everything we're doing in Ohio is to figure out how to stop our spread of disease. And testing is just crucial for that. The way we will save lives in Ohio as we all move about more is to stop the spread of disease. And so you'll hear more about that in days to come. Um, but it, when you are tested or not, whether you've recovered or not, we don't know how long immunity lasts. So all the things we talk about that are allow this economy to come back, to allow us to move about, means that we have to wear this mask and try to not spread it to others. We have to wash the hands. We have to say when we're sick. If our child is sick, we shouldn't take them to child care. If we ourselves are sick and have a fever, we need to not, not go to work. These were the basics we learned in the beginning. They matter all the more now, because what we're trying to do is increasing our moving about safely, but not have the chance of spreading it or having an outbreak. So really, it, it really relies on all of us doing our part. Um, the next thing I want to say is a little bit about the antibody testing. We're very excited. I know some new stories have run that in the next weeks we will be doing um, some testing throughout Ohio. This is voluntary. Uh, we're starting with a random sample that represents all of Ohio. And so will be 1,200 samples taken, 1,200 people who volunteer, but they represent all of us. Um, they're volunteering to help us learn more about the prevalence of this disease, many of whom may not know they've already had it. So we'll be taking, um, we'll be sending out a postcard 
that will be followed out to citizens with a letter and ultimately someone who would actually come to their house and test someone 18 years of older in the house. We'd learn a lot about you and we'd actually take a nasal swab and do a blood test. And this will be all over. It will be urban. It will be rural. Again, voluntary particip participation in a study that helps us le learn more about coronavirus in Ohio. So we're very excited about that. It would never have been possible were it not for NetJets and Celix and, and the work of whole teams of scientists around the state who, have, who are working together with healthcare providers to help us learn more about this disease. I want to say one more thing. As we open up more and more, we know that we'll see um, more spread of this disease. We know we'll see more cases. Whether we opened up or didn't, this disease, most of us are still not immune, and this disease is going to continue to spread. That shouldn't be a surprise to us. But what's more important is when we discover the disease, what we do about it. So I really want to say this to businesses, to child cares, to nursing homes, to prisons, to homeless shelters, to all of us. When you first discover a case, maybe you have an employee who all of a sudden you hear was diagnosed, I think a lot of us won't know what to do right away. We might, even though we've read all the guidance, the first place you should always go is call your local health department. We have those phone numbers on our website. We are here not to regulate you. We are here to help you um, do the best practices. And, and they're really going to be your experts. If you go to coronavirus.ohio.gov, no matter who you are, no matter what walk, what business, whether you're a child care center, whether you're a nursing home, we really want to help you walk through the best guidance from the CDC help you help your employees, help you know where to get help, and contain that infection so it doesn't spread. And, and I think that's where all of us together are going to work to keep Ohio safe. So I'll be glad to answer more questions, but um, I just want to spread coronavirus.ohio.gov and reaching out to your local health department. Thank you. Dr. Acton, thank you very much. We'll be ready now for questions. This is uh, Luis Gill from Ohio Latino TV. And you mentioned a few minutes ago that the economy tomorrow will be at 90%, but we understand that some establishments or business might not be able to function, not even at 50%. Are these businesses might be getting some relief through the process that the economy really, for them, will be at 90 or 100% the way it used to be? I think the most important thing uh, as we open the economy up uh, is for the public to have confidence that when they go to a restaurant, when they go to a uh, jewelry store, when they go to the grocery store, that everything is being done that can be done to protect them. And I think that's really the most important thing that, that we can do. So um, we're, we've reached a stage in this uh, kind of journey uh, of ours where it's not so much what we're saying the director is saying what she orders. Uh, it is more about the public's confidence. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's, that's what's going to determine how fast this economy moves. And that's why we, we've been very careful um, as we put our groups together to come out with the best protocols so that when you walk into any particular kind of store that you could have assurance as the customer that the good best practices are, are taking place. It's also important for workers to feel the same way. Uh, when they go in, make sure that they are, that business is following the best practices to protect them. So I think that's probably more important, or is more than important, uh, than, than anything else. And the, the regulations that we've set forward, these are things that people in the industry have said, we can do these. They've said, we can do these. Not only have they said that we can do them, they were part of putting them together. And, and so I think that uh, really is the most important thing, is how people feel about this, the confidence that they feel. And we're doing everything we can to give them good confidence so they can go out and, and, and shop or they can go out and go to the restaurant, whatever, whatever they want to do. You know, as far as the capacity, um, you know, capacity again um, – we have to do that consistent with what is safe. Uh, we've done not, not, 
not done anything more than what is necessary to protect people uh, and to keep them safe. And again, that confidence that people have is, is the most important thing. Good afternoon, Governor Ben Schwartz with WCPO. Um, I want to read a question sent in from a viewer. This viewer is the president of a local nonprofit sports organization, youth sports organization, who has uh, testified in front of the Ohio Economic Recovery Task Force and is just looking for any type of word on if you've had talks about reopening youth sports this year. Um, we know it's an evolving situation, but there's deadlines that they have to hit, and if they don't, it's not happening. Um, so wondering if you've, if you've had talks, and then maybe if Dr. Acton can comment on if distancing in sports outdoors is comparable at all to eating. We know that we're now in May, and people are planning for the summer. Uh, youth sports leagues, adult sport, sports leagues, uh, but also, uh, you know, what the city of Columbus or the city of Cincinnati or the city of Dayton or Toledo, different programs that they might have for young people that might include sports, but it also might include some, some sort of day camps. Um, so these are all very important, uh, and it's important that young people have something to do during the summer. Uh, it's important that people be able to plan. So uh, I'm looking down at the list of all the different uh, working groups that we have, and we certainly have a group that is working right now um, on, these, on these issues uh, in regard to uh, youth uh, and adult uh, sports. And so we hope to have something out uh, fairly, fairly shortly as far as guidance. And look, government should not be micromanaging this. What we're trying to do is just take best practices uh, and give the broad guidelines, and then people can, uh, you know, really take it, take it from there. Dr. Acton. Oh, thank you, Governor. So I, as we've said many times in these press conferences, um, the whole world is learning about this together. And, you know, one of the reasons we set up um, these groups is to really – try to imagine how we could live in a world pre-vaccine and learn to live with this virus. And, and it's not been done before. There is no exact playbook. So, you know, we've really tried to pull together the best experts from all walks of life and people, you know, who are actually running the programs to the best medical and clinical advice that we can get. And so as soon as we learn more, we will absolutely share that you know, it's important that we make these decisions with as much knowledge as possible. Um, the virus is still there. You know, I, I like to say, and I know the governor's been doing a very nice job of this, you know, it's very important that we remember that it still is something that will spread. And the more people we are around in close proximity, the greater chance that is. That's why we still have language about being safe. And, and we're trying to ask people to go about your business but it isn't to go about and just go back to normal. It really is to be judicious in the choices you make, um, do all, all of the protections you can do, um, and, and as we gradually try to see how much we can expand our lives. So I think this is something we're looking into. Thank you both very much. This is Laura Hancock from cleveland.com. I have a question about the onset that Dr. Acton was talking about. Um, do you know what five counties were the counties with the onset in January? And then also, do you know, um, can you explain like what, what's going on, what you think is going on in Franklin County, which has gotten so far ahead in cases? Uh, hi, thank you so much. I do not know, I don't have with me the counties. Um, and uh, I do think it's very interesting that we have started to see the results of antibody testing, and I think we'll see a lot more of this. I also think um, there are a lot of deaths and coroner reports yet to be seen. So I think as time goes on, uh, we will learn more and more about history uh, with this virus. Um, and, and I really, you know, I would refer you to talk, you know, with Franklin County, both Columbus and um, Franklin County itself, to learn more, um, I can't speak at this point to the specifics of um, um, their cases, but I think those health commissioners could give you more of that. Okay, thank 
you. Hello, it's uh, Andrew Welsh Huggins uh, from the Associated Press. This question is probably for uh, Governor DeWine and also Dr. Acton. Um, Today, uh, Vice President Mike Pence and uh, Dr. Deborah Burks uh, called on governors to make sure that all one million nursing home residents in the country and workers are tested in the next two weeks. And after that, workers should be tested weekly. So my questions are, uh, is that doable in Ohio? Do we know how many people we're talking about and if we have that testing uh, capacity? And uh, what kind of assistance, especially uh, federal assistance, would you need to meet that deadline? Well, first of all, we are uh, significantly increasing our testing capacity, uh, but we are also increasing the number of tests that have been given. And let me, let me actually give those numbers if I can pull that up here, if I can find it. Excuse me just a moment. Um, you know, we are, we are now um, at a, a testing capacity uh, in Ohio. Let me get the n exact number. Um, we're now at a capacity of 14,275 a day, but that is going up. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we should be at 22,000. 22, uh, this is a chart that kind of shows actual testing. Uh, and as you can see, we have gone from the week of April 19th to the April 25th. Um, we have gone from... 4,100 actual tests that week. The next week, uh, it was 5,180. Uh, and the week we just completed was 7,259. So those numbers are going up. They're going to continue to, they're going to continue to go up. Um, but we certainly do not have unlimited testing. Um, we have uh, stated that we have had a, a plan in regard to our nursing homes. Uh, I've actually asked uh, as Maureen uh, to come in here uh, next week. Uh, Maureen uh, Corcoran, who is uh, our director, uh, come in actually in tomorrow, excuse me, uh, and she'll be Skyped in and really give a full report on exactly what we are doing in regard to, to nursing homes. Uh, so it is uh, something that... If you look at the numbers, uh, our Ohio numbers are not dissimilar to the national numbers, and that is that the huge number of our deaths are occurring in nursing homes and in prisons and congregate care facilities, uh, very, very significant part of those. Uh, and that pains us a great deal. Um, you know, most of us who have had uh, parents, uh, aunts and uncles, uh, loved ones, in nursing homes. Uh, if we don't now, uh, we have it sometime in the past. And, and you know, th protecting them uh, is, is so very, very, very important. Uh, so we have, we have focused on these nursing homes a lot. I'm gonna let Dr. Acton talk for a moment about that, but the full report is gonna come from Maureen tomorrow uh, when she comes in, uh, because in addition to her uh, duties in running Medicaid, we've asked her really to to oversee this this whole effort. Uh, we've got tremendous assistance from our hospitals, uh, and what is kind of I think unique about Ohio's plan is the work that the hospitals have done in basically adopting nursing homes, and so every nursing home has been adopted by a, a hospital, uh, which is which is very significant. Uh, as we look at the care. So it's, testing is, is very important, um, but it is not the entire picture in regard to the nursing homes. And we have a whole, the whole plan that's in place. Dr. Acton, want to add anything to that before we get to Maureen tomorrow? Yeah, I think, you know, Director Corcoran will be joining us. I want to say there are a couple things that Ohio, I think, and over time I hope to even share more broadly with my colleagues, but where I'm talking about going back to early March, we recognized where we thought some of the hot spots would be in our state early on, and, and we're very concerned about nursing homes. So we have been working tirelessly on really pushing the envelope on keeping our nursing homes safe since that time. And part of it was this building of a zone and regional structure, something that 
never existed before. We've never had something of this nature, of this um, amount of cases. There, there really wasn't a structure. And so what Director Corcoran will be sharing is really a complicated thing, far beyond testing, really. It's been about relationships with the nursing home. We've had the CDC with us in state doing investigations, and each one is different, and each one needs a different response. It's using testing, but we've also worked to get PPE to nursing homes and really help to help both the staff and the clients there be as safe as possible. We've worked with local health departments, with whole communities, and with hospitals. So it is a very comprehensive plan. As I mentioned earlier, you know, testing and testing in one point of time gives you a snapshot, but it really is a much more strategic effort it takes to actually catch those cases and prevent the spread of disease. And so we really look forward to sharing with you what I think is an unprecedented response that we've been working on here in Ohio. And your part of that, part of that, as Maureen will tell you tomorrow, uh, includes whenever we, whenever nursing home uh, has someone who, you know, they, they think is in fact uh, might be COVID-19, the ability then to come in and, and do that strategic uh, testing. Uh, you know, that is that is essential part of this. And I want to add some, something else. Uh, I got a call yesterday from, uh, it was a heartbreaking call, uh, but it's something that many Ohio families tragically are facing, and that is that they they have someone in a nursing home and they cannot go see them. Uh, and this is just, to me, one of the most heartbreaking things. Uh, and, you know, what we're faced with uh, is a situation that we know that once COVID-19 gets inside a nursing home, we know how dangerous that is. And so trying to limit um, the opportunities for that COVID-19 to come in uh, is is so very very important, and so one of the orders that was issued very early on was to restrict the people who could go into that nursing home, um, and visitors were basically not not allowed. And, and I just want to say to families out there, I I understand it. Uh, I mean, I can imagine uh, you know with a loved one in a nursing home if I could not go see them, uh, and this is just something that. You know, trying to figure out the right the right balance here, but because it is so deadly, and because once it gets inside, it is so tough. You know that that has been that's why that policy exists. But I understand the great hardship, and I understand uh, that it has an impact not only on the family; it certainly has an impact on that patient. I guess within this context, does Ohio plan to comply with the specific directive from the White House to test all nursing home residents and patients within the next two weeks? I don't, I don't know if that's going to get done. Uh, and again, I think that, uh, you know, we'll talk about that tomorrow. But I think what's important for anybody who's got a family member out there in a nursing home or anybody who is in a nursing home, we not only have a plan, we are executing the plan, have been executing the plan. It's a holistic plan. It's a plan that combines taking hospitals and pairing them with nursing homes. It, com it adds to that, doing everything that we can to get the PPE in into the nursing home. It involves having a robust testing whenever there is a hotspot whenever there is a reason for that nursing home to believe that someone in that nursing home is might be positive for COVID-19. Uh, that is something that, that we have had in place. We now have the, the robust testing to carry out uh, that, the testing part of that as well. So I think it's, you know, I think it would be unlikely uh, that you would see us be able to test everybody in the nursing home. Uh, there is frankly, uh, a lot of, of people in the medical field who would argue uh, that the testing of everybody in that nursing home is might not be the, the best protocol. So again, I'm going to leave it to Maureen tomorrow when she's in here, and she'll she'll explain it a lot better than that I'm explaining it. Thank you.
Adrian Robbins, NBC4, and my question's for the governor or possibly the lieutenant governor. We've gotten a, quite a few emails from gym owners, especially smaller gyms, who feel like they should have been part of this reopening wave. Do you have an update for gyms, and what are some of the unique, I guess, barriers that have kept them from, from receiving a reopen date? Well, we have, we have a working group. Uh, again, these are gym owners. These are people who do this every single day. Gyms are different in the sense that some are big, some are small. We have all kinds of size of, of gyms. Um, so th this is something that can happen. Uh, this is something that we intend to happen. Um, and it's coming. So, uh, you know, we all, anybody who's been to a gym, I, I go to a gym in, in Springfield, or I did go to a gym in Springfield. Um, you know, I think we all understand the kind of the nature of, 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 of gyms themselves. And uh, it's any, any, like anything else uh, when people are there in close proximity uh, that the sanitation part of that is, is vitally important. But that doesn't mean it can't be done. Uh, and we, we would expect that we would be able to... Um, you know, open, open our gyms, and uh, as soon as the group comes back with their recommendations, we're, we're going to review those and move forward. Thank you. Governor, I can, I can add that the first call was at 9.30, and, um, and so I know that they're having the conversations, this process for discussing it's underway, but understand every, every situation between personal training, classes, equipment, the fact that you can't practice social distancing in a lot of those settings all have to be accounted for, which are a little more complex than a lot of the other situations that we're in. Good afternoon, Governor. Randy Ludlow with the Columbus Dispatch. Uh, you just stated the state has a testing capacity of 14,275 tests a day, yet you're only doing slightly more than half that number. Uh, what's the problem? Well, Randy, here's, here's the chart, my friend. We're going up every single week. Um, this is not just a question of you turn on a spigot. Uh, it, is a, it is a question where you've got to get everything out. Uh, we have a number of locations in the state of Ohio that are doing this. We're getting the reagent to them. Uh, we're getting the swabs to not only those locations, but many other locations as well. Uh, so our goal is to continue to see those numbers go up. Uh, we have, as I, as I said, in a two-week period, we've gone from 4,100 to 7,200. Uh, I would fully expect those numbers to continue to climb forward. It was 18,000 a day. Are you going to get there? Yeah, we're going to get there, Randy. We're, we're, look, we're, 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 we're going to get there. Um, this is not something where you snap your fingers and say, all these tests are going, are going to occur. We had to first get the capacity. Uh, and several weeks ago, we started, signed the contracts, got the reagent coming in, got the swabs being manufactured in the state of, state of Ohio. Uh, so this is a dramatic increase uh, in, in testing. Uh, you got to start with your capacity, and then you've got to build, build up upward from that. So uh, I'm not unhappy with where, where we are. Uh, I'm always impatient. Uh, I think you know me. Uh, I want to. I would love to be up right today at uh, you know 22,000, uh, but uh, you know we are making very uh, significant progress. And I would again for our listeners out there, these numbers are per day. These are tests that are per day. Uh, but I'm always pushing and uh, never never satisfied. So we're 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 moving we're moving forward. Thank you. We're going to continue. Dr. Acton. Yeah. I, Randy, I'd like to address that a little better. I think in the sense of not better than the governor. I don't mean that. But just go a little bit deeper on it for everyone at home. Testing is a immensely complex issue. And as you have seen, we have faced every possible shortage and barrier within the supply chain. So one of the things we learned early on was that we had to have multiple things happen. We had to have the right kind of machines and get them in the right places around the state so that they were equitably dispersed so that everyone has access to testing. That's very, very important to us. And one of the reasons we used our zone structure was to make that possible. 
then you had to have the ability to actually swab and get the kit and go get the specimen. So when these numbers were shared, and I think when we share these numbers, it's very hard to explain all the complexity. It was about getting the capacity out there. So when we say the capacity to do 14,000 plus tests this week, we finally, we have machines, we big borrowed steel, stole them out of research labs, bought some of them ourselves, and positioned them around the state. And we actually made a deal to have a constant supply reagent, which has been one of the hardest things for us. So we know that that capacity is there. The next set of struggles you have is making sure that just like we talked about the nursing home, that we can get someone in that nursing home with that kit and get that swab and then get that swab to the lab. And that whole process has been under development as well and being refined. And we are actually looking at some unique ways to do that so that we don't miss anyone. We're actually talking about ways to have mobile units or, or really swab um, like uh, strike teams that actually can go out and be mobile and rush those specimens. We also had a complicating factor of some places actually have contracts with private labs, so they use a different system. On top of that, you know, we have created 67,500 new specimen kits, so we have pushed those kits out to local health departments through our EMAs, and they're trying to get those out to those nursing homes and frontline places where they're needed. So it is doing all of that, plus we had to create a protocol because even when we have this much, if we have all the kits and we have all the reagents, we have all the ability to run the tests, we really had to decide how do we fairly test when we don't have enough. And that was the tears I shared with you last week, getting those asymptomatic frontline workers, healthcare workers, getting in our nursing homes and high risk places where we know the disease spreads and can be lethal. And so all of that is what you know our, our two governors uh, from the past, uh, Governor Celeste, Governor Taft, and a whole team have been working tirelessly on. So I think when we say that number, it's about the capacity of the machines and the reagent, but it's not enough to do that. We actually have to be there then maximizing the use of that, and that's all things we're working on, pressing full court press, and the governor is on me every single day to make sure that is happening. Thank you, Director. Good afternoon, this is Jackie Borchert from the Cincinnati Inquirer. Um, a lot of parents and child care providers were tuning into your press conference today hoping to hear some good news for when um, child care may be available. I've already heard reports of centers considering smaller capacity, reduced hours, reduced services in order to, to keep everybody safe. Um, given how these may change the child care situation, will you do anything to allow parents to remain on unemployment compensation in order to care for their children if returning them to a child care situation is not in the best interest of the child? Well, return that child to the child care, that's obviously a, a parental decision, but what my obligation is, is is to do everything in our power to make that a safe environment. Um, you know, the essential child care that has been existing, that we provided um, during the last several months, and I realized most people couldn't take advantage of that, but that child care that was provided, that was taking care of, of, of children, uh, was probably... Uh, the the most um, smallest ratio of child to to teacher child to to caregiver uh, in the country, and so you know we were very very careful when we put that together. Uh, now, as we talk about dramatically opening that up uh, and in making that available to people who are going back to work, you know we want to make sure that we have it right this time as well. And by right, I mean doing everything in our power to assure the workers that they'll be safe, but also to, the, to those parents who, who take those children there every single day, that that's going to be a safe place for them, for them to, take, to take that child. So that's, that's, that's our goal. That's what we're trying to do. And, you know, look, I apologize for the people who tuned in today and, and wanted an answer today, but I think, you know, what we owe you is a good answer. Uh, and we're, we're, we're going to get that, but uh, we're not quite there yet. 
Well, the, the federal expansion of unemployment for pandemic unemployment assistance allowed parents to collect that unemployment if they are caring for children whose schools have closed from COVID-19. Do you plan to extend that in Ohio as well? John, you want to take the unemployment side of that? Jackie, it's a great question in light of the, of the child care situation. Uh, I, I, we don't have an answer on that today, but we do owe you an answer on it, and, and we'll respond uh, in the context of when we pull this all together on child care, but I don't have an answer on that today. Hi, this is Danny Elder, just Hannah News Service. Um, so can you talk with the testing, can you talk about uh, when people will be able to just, you know, drive up and get testing? Like in, in Kentucky, I understand that people, you know, pretty much anyone can get a test if they want one in certain areas. Like, wh how close are we to getting to that? Well, You've got a couple of things going on. I don't know what's going on in Kentucky, uh, but certainly, certainly the private sector. You're going to see the private sector uh, roll in with, with with testing. What our testing has to be is a, a prioritization, uh, which Dr. Acton has has rolled out. I mean, our goal every day is to do everything we can with every tool we have, and testing is certainly a, one of those tools to save lives, uh, to stop the spread. Spread is the key, uh, and so testing. Uh, and the, the, the tracing uh, that we have talked about so much is absolutely essential, occurring in 113 different health departments around the state. So, you know, going to the basics, the blocking and tackling, uh, and, and making sure that we are doing things to, to protect lives is, is the most important. And so we prioritized it. And, and Dr. Acton has talked about that prioritization. Um, Dr. Acton, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, um, I, I talk quite often to my peer in Kentucky, and they've done a lot of the same sort of strategies that we have done. And I know that there is, I mean, to complicate testing even further, as you know, new types of tests come to market, um, and there are some being done um, through the private sector. Uh, antigen testing just hit um, and got approval this week. That's uh, that even a stay at home and do a test. So I think a lot of these products are happening, um, and some of them have more or less reliability to them. Um, there's also people out there selling tests. They're, like I've said before, they're selling tests to businesses um, that we, we don't have a lot of science or understanding of. So when I hear a story like that, it really uh, you know, it begets a lot more questions, and I'll, I'll definitely talk to Kentucky to learn more about that. CVS and Walgreens anytime soon, something, or, you know, just for example, could be other places. Well, I think some, some of the pharmacy companies have already started to do that. Uh, aren't you seeing some yeah, of that? Th I, I mean, think that, that's look, in that's, yep. you know, that's, some of them have already started to do that. All right, thank you. Hi, Aran Hammy with WLIO in Lima. Uh, Governor, I know you've already touched on some summer activities, but the first county fair is approaching quick. I know Paulding County's going to have theirs in roughly about four weeks, and we're hearing that ride inspectors and fair liaisons have been furloughed by the state. Um, just wondering if you had an update from your fair advisory group. Are they leaning towards just holding junior fairs this year? We're waiting for the, the advisory groups. I don't have an update. Uh, I mean, what I've talked about, as you know, uh, is that fairs need to be thinking about, you know, how they can conduct a fair that preserves the junior fair. How do you conduct a fair that preserves 4-H? Um, this is about kids. Uh, it's about kids and their livestock. It's about kids and their photography project, their cooking project, their sewing project. Um, the science project, um, that's what this really is about. And how do we preserve that uh, in all the counties uh, across the state of Ohio and the, the county fairs and the independent fairs uh, because they are really the heart and soul of those fairs. And they're not only the heart and soul of the fairs, they're the heart and soul of that community. So, you know, what I've asked the different fair boards as we move towards this 
to to look and see how they can preserve uh, that that type of fare uh, as they move forward. Our working group is working. They're going to come back with recommendations. Uh, as you know, one county fair, uh, Marion, uh, you know, postponed their fair. Uh, but uh, my, it's my understanding that they are looking at how they can, again, preserve the, the 4-H side of it, the FFA part of that, and the, the junior fair side of that. Looking at going on without those rides, without those inspectors, correct? Well, inspectors can always, look, the inspectors can always be brought back uh, if, if that's where we go. Um, so there hasn't been a decision made on that. I just think if you, if you look at... Uh, None of us have a crystal ball. Fairs spread out throughout the summer and into the fall. Uh, so we have, a, you know, fairs every, every month. Uh, and so we don't know where we'll be at different fair times. So the, they, they certainly could be brought back uh, if the decision is made to have, to have those rides and have that type of activity. So that's, we'll see. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. Marty Schladen, the Ohio Capital Journal. Uh, in March, uh, Congress increased uh, federal medical assistance percentages, the support for uh, federal support for Medicaid by 6.2 points. And now the National Governors Association is calling for another six percentage point increase. Do you support that? And if you do, do you call on your former colleagues in the Senate to support it and for Governor, or Governor, for President Trump to sign it? Congress uh, has uh, spent a lot of money, uh, and unprecedented in the history of this of this country. Um, there is a need for that. I, I think the most important thing for us, and I want to stay focused on my message. The most important thing for us is flexibility in how we spend that money. Uh, we just had to make a, a, a very significant cut in schools that we did not want to make, um, and that I don't think anyone wanted to see in Ohio. Uh, so, and that was for a two-month period of time, um, but it was a significant cut for that two-month period of time. So as we move forward, the maximum flexibility that we can have as a state uh, would certainly be very, very, very important. Uh, I think there's also a need uh, for additional funds uh, for our, our local communities, again, uh, for our, our cities and our villages and our townships. Uh, counties and for them to have flexibility uh, and there certainly is an additional need for for us uh, as, as well but that flexibility and that ability to be able to uh, deal with not just the not just things that are directly related but that are indirectly related whenever you have an economy going down as ours obviously has uh, two things happen they always happen uh, your social service cost goes up uh, and your revenues goes down dramatically. And so that's what we, we're seeing, uh, and that's what, you know, we can fully expect to see in the months, in the months ahead. I'd like to see that increase, though. I'll look, at the, I'll look at the specific proposal. I have not looked at that specific proposal. I'm saying that my message to, to, to the, our representatives, and I've talked to them a lot about this, uh, uh, Senator Brown, Senator Portman, our congressional delegation, uh, has been give us the flexibility. Give us some flexibility uh, so that we can move this money around and cover different holes. And these are things that are, are basics. And, and, and the local government has the same problem. Uh, you know, the vast majority, of a huge amount of the local government funding has to go for police and fire. Uh, EMS, basic services. And, uh, you know, with, without that flexibility, you're going to start seeing these cut at the local level, and that's a, that's a big problem. Thank you, Governor. Hello, Governor. Jim Province with the Toledo Blade. Um, Governor, you didn't get to uh, give your State of the State address this year, at least not yet. I'm not asking you to give us that speech now, but in a nutshell, given the virus, the economy, and the budget cuts, how would you grade the condition of our state? Well, I think, uh, you know, we're going through a storm. Uh, it's a very severe storm. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're doing well under those conditions. 
Uh, this is not a storm that anyone th thought was coming, uh, or at least uh, you know, a number of months ago. I don't think anyone would have predicted it. And it's tough. I mean, it's tough. I think Ohioans have done phenomenally well. Um, a lot of suffering. Uh, a lot of people unemployed. Uh, a lot of small businesses that severely hurt. Um, but Ohioans, I think, have done exceedingly well under the circumstances. Uh, they have done what needed to be done. Uh, so that we flatten that curve so that we're in a position to open Ohio carefully. Um, and it's important that we can all continue to do the distancing and, and, and wear the mask and do the other things. But I think Ohioans have done, frankly, exceedingly well. And we were positioned about as well as, as, we, could, as we could be. But um, the challenge continues every single day. It's not like we've played this game out. Um, you know, we've, 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 we've finished the first inning or two, I guess. But, uh, you know, we have to continue to perform every single day. And look, at the questions that have been asked today have all been very legitimate questions. Um, you know, how fast can we move up testing? Um, you know, how, what would we do about our nursing homes? What do we do about, um, you know, all, all the congregate care facilities where we and every other state are losing so many different people. So these are all legitimate questions. Um, my, I guess, commitment to the people of the state of Ohio is that this, this team that, and you're only seeing a small part of the team, but we're working on this every day. We're bringing people from the private sector in. We brought a couple of go former governors in. We're bringing anybody that we can get our hands on uh, to help us work through this. Um, and we're doing pretty well, but am I satisfied with where we are? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I'm not satisfied with where we are. We can't be satisfied. We got challenges every single day. So I think, I think Ohioans are doing well. I think they perform exceedingly well, but we have to keep performing and we have to keep doing things. And now we're, now we're trying to do two things, put an economy back together at the same time that we are, uh, keeping, keeping Ohioans safe and we're going to keep focused. So Ohio, Ohioans are tough. Um, they're resilient and they're fighters. We're going to keep fighting. Question regarding unemployment benefits uh, availability due to lack of child care. Currently, nobody is being denied uh, for that reason. I have Director Kim Hall to give a 30 second or so uh, response on that who's on the phone. Uh, Director Hall? Thank you, Lieutenant Governor and Governor. So the return to work uh, guidelines that are in place um, are, are currently being evaluated for opportunities to examine more deeply the health and safety aspects. Certainly that has always been a consideration. COVID-19 adds an additional layer there. No benefits are being denied right now as a result of uh, a person's decision not to return to work while we continue to evaluate the policy. Great. Thank, thank you, Kim. Ohio Public Radio and Television State House News Bureau. I wanted to ask you about uh, tattoo shops and body art studios. When do you think you might hear an announcement on that? And what makes them different from the salons and day spas and tanning facilities? Well, we gave that to our, our working group. Um, you know, again, it's, per, it's very up close personal. Uh, it's different, uh, but a lot of, there certainly are a lot of similarities. Um, my understanding, uh, I checked right before we came in, uh, is that we have this back. Uh, I just need to take a look at it, and we would expect to uh, be making an announcement in the next couple of days on that. So we're not, not trying to hold anybody up, but again, uh, we we got to get this right. Uh, we got to get this, this have the right standards, and uh, that people when they when they open back up, that people will say, look, uh, you know, they're following the best practices that they can follow. So it's coming shortly. Lacey Crisp from Ten TV. Um, you said you're opening up about eighty percent of the economy by the end of the week. What do you say to those parents? What advice do you have to, to those parents who are returning to work 
but don't know when they're actually going to have childcare so they actually can return to the workforce. Look, I, I fully under, understand that. Um, this is not something, uh, and, and let me just go back. When we close schools and then close daycare centers, child care, it was not done lightly. We fully understood the, the grave, grave ramifications of that. But the science is pretty clear, and I don't think you have to be a scientist. Even I understand it, that when you take young children who social distancing is rather difficult for a two-year-old or three-year-old or four-year-old and put them into a group setting, um, the, the, the danger uh, is not so much for those kids themselves. The danger is you've taken people kids from a number of families you put them together and then they go back they may not any of them show any symptoms at all but what we know is one of them may be carrying this uh, and then so now you've got eight families 10 families 15 20 families and it goes back to those families so I think the scientists would tell you that one of the most important things you do early on is the closure of, of these facilities because of the fact of where we need to because of the tremendous spread uh, that, that is occurring. So as we put these back, we got to get it right. We got to do everything that we can. We got to pull whatever resource we can so that we minimize that danger. And so we maximize the safety for the child, maximize the safety of that child care worker, and maximize the safety of those families and the, and the community. So we're going to have an answer, but what I owe the people of the state and those particular ones, uh, people who are waiting for this answer, is I owe them the best we can give them because that's what they should expect when they drop off their child, and that is my commitment to them, and that's what I'm going to do. But for those parents who are returning to work this week, what advice do you have for them for child care if they have to make the decision of going to work or staying at home with their child? I, I make a lot of decisions every day. Uh, I'm not going to get in the way of the parent making that decision or tell a parent what kind of decision to make or even suggest that. That's not, that's not my uh, job, uh, nor I, I think it would be very presumptuous of me uh, to, to try to answer that. Thank you. Governor, that was our last question for today. Ohio is home uh, to so many cultural institutions. Uh, the arts have always reflected the times in which we live, and they serve to lift our spirits. Today, I want to tell you about a project the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra and the Cincinnati Pops has announced. It's called the Fanfare Project. The inspiration for the initiative is Aaron Copeland's Fanfare for the Common Man, which was commissioned by the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra in 1942 in support of Allied efforts and as a testament to the American spirit during World War II. The orchestra gave the world premiere on March 12, 1943. The Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra and the Pops are now spearheading a new fanfare project in which more than a dozen composers representing a diverse range of personal and, and musical backgrounds will write one-minute fanfares for individual musicians of their choice in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Eric?
great. Thank you all. We'll see you tomorrow at 2 o'clock. Thank you.